Before becoming the uh, finance minister of the Czech Republic, uh, you, you served as minister of transportation. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which also... Uh, David, David years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and which, of course, in this, uh, in this era we live in with high energy prices, uh, you know, perhaps you're, you're lucky you're no longer in that, that role and you're in the uh, finance ministry role. And then, of course, you've had a distinguished um, career in, in, in parliament, in the chamber of deputies. So we're, we're honored to um, host you here today at the Hudson Institute. Um, the minister has uh, some opening remarks he will deliver, and then I will turn it into a uh, conversation and open it up to questions from the floor. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm not sure if my speech will, uh, will short. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am pleased to be here with, with you today. And uh, this is my first time visiting uh, the United States, and I welcome opportunity to share with you some thoughts about the economic and security implication of the current crisis from the perspective of the Czech EU presidency. I would like to address a few issues. What is happening in Europe? Who is responsible uh, for what is happening? When and how will it end? And finally, what do we need to about it? Some of these questions are not difficult to answer. Unfortunately, after decades of peace, there is war in Europe. Russia's unprovoked, unjustified, brutal, Aggression against Ukraine has drastically changed the transatlantic geopolitical, geopolitical landscape. It has affected the lives not only of to, those fleeing the war, but also of the citizens of the EU and of the whole world. The EU economy, uh, EU economy has not yet fully recovered from the COVID pandemic and now it, uh, it is experiencing another major shock. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused a humanitarian disaster with tens of thousands of civilians killed and millions more displaced. It, it uh, has also led to a deep regional economic slowdown and negative global spillover, spillovers. Russia, Russia's weaponization of Natural gas has brought the price of electricity to an unprecedented level. Extremely high energy costs are not only affecting our citizens, but they are also damaging the ability to European industrial companies to compete globally. On top of that, the Russian war is affecting the EU public finances to maintain economic growth European governments are looking for ways to manage the skyrocketing energy prices, high inflation, uncertainty on markets, increasing borrowing costs, and other burning issues. However, these solutions are neither easy nor cheap. Over the recent months, the public expenditure in all EU member states has increased in an unprecedented way. We are working hard to support the most vulnerable citizens and maintain social cohesion. We are fighting populism and Russia disinformation and promoting solidarity with Ukraine. The times ahead of, uh, 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 ahead of us will be extremely challenging. The Slovak economy will reduce fiscal revenues. Governments across Europe will need to keep the fiscal cost from inflating while protecting the most vulnerable. The financial and budgetary pressures in Europe will increase when we start addressing the cost of reconstruction of Ukraine. Although the current situation of the battlefield may seem more hopeful than a few months ago, we don't know when the Russian war will end. What we do know is that the reconstruction will be extremely complex and the financial needs astronomical. The Russia's war is main cause of decline in global growth. 
Domain with the global economy include social unrest in countries facing food shortage and increase in debt distress in the poorest countries. We will discuss how we can respond to these burning issues at the IMF meeting uh, this week here in uh, Washington. But uh, we must admit uh, that for many years, much of Europe benefited from the cheap Russian gas. It is also the case of my homeland, uh, the Czech Republic, which has not uh, diversified gas supplies in recent decades, as in almost 100% 100, 100 uh, dependent of, on Gazprom. The Russian war has forced us to drastically change our energy policy. We must do it by means of revolution because there are too little time for evolution. When we end uh, our energy dependence of, on the post-Soviet Russia, we will finally complete the process that began 30 years, 30 years ago with the Velvet uh, Revolution. Cutting out of our connection to Russia it, it is not the only solution to the current situation. There are connections that are positive and uh, should be kept. I'm talking about the relationship between Europe and the United States, both within NATO and bilateral. We must keep the transatlantic link strong in response to the Russian battle attack on Ukraine. I want to thank the United States for its financial and material assistance to Ukraine. Like before in history, we see once again that standing firmly against evil is not only right, but it's also effective. Let me conclude by saying that strengthening defense in Europe uh, is a task for domestic uh, governments as well as NATO structures. In the Czech Republic, we take this very seriously. We are in the process of creating a special budgetary tool to increase the defense spending to 2% of uh, GDP. Our goal is to modernize the Czech army force and provide the army uh, with uh, ultra-modern equipment, such, a, such as the fifth generation of fighters that can operate alongside other NATO allies. Many other EU governments are also looking for ways to combine fiscal balance with security interests. We have no other choice if we want to ensure the Europe's security in these difficult times. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> well, you touched on all the, all the main issues, and I appreciate that. It makes my job easier <laughs> uh, speaking to you here today. Um, but, but before we dive into some of the policy issues, um, I wanted to ask you about your role as the finance minister for the country that is currently the, uh, holding the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Um, you, you highlighted all of the uh, challenges that, that we're facing, but for you, it's particularly important, and it's almost a historic occasion, uh, being the finance minister of the country currently in the role of the presidency. So can you tell us a little bit about how your obligations uh, as uh, during the Czech Republic's presidency impact your thinking, your decision making? And could you also maybe explain to an American audience what it means for a country inside the EU to have that rotating presidency of the uh, European Council? Uh, okay. Budu požívat český jazyk, abych se vyjádřil přesně. All right, I will speak uh, Czech so that I can express myself precisely. Já jsem konzervativní politik a očekával jsem například ještě v lednu, že ty veřejné dluhy a zadlužení a deficit státního rozpočtu budeme snižovat mnohem rychleji, než je možné dnes. I'm a conservative politician and uh, actually, to be honest, uh, in uh, January I was hoping that we would be uh, lowering the debt uh, and keeping the fiscal policy uh, in a much tighter way than we are today. Ale to 24. února, kdy Putin strhl na Ukrajinu, se všechno změnilo. But on the 24th of February, when Putin attacked Ukraine, everything changed. 
My vlastně každý týden, každém rozhodnutí naše vlády hledáme balans rovnováhu mezi třemi základními pilíři. Uh, basically every week when we have talks in government we are looking for balance between three basic pillars. Social peace, fiscal discipline and investment. A uh, abych odpověděl na tu otázku, jaká je role té prezidentské země, tak je to vlastně ten, kdo moderuje debatu, kdo vnáší témata a snaží se najít většinový názor pro to, abychom mohli, mohli společně rozhodovat důležité finanční věci. To answer your question, uh, the role of the presidency country is really uh, to be a moderator of the debate, uh, to put topics on the table and start discussions uh, uh, so that we can reach conclusions on certain topics. Naše předsednictví má asi pět základních priorit a na prvním místě je vlastně pomoc Ukrajině a řešení dopadů této války na ekonomiky evropských zemí. Our presidency has five uh, major topics, five issues, and the biggest one is actually Ukraine and the impact uh, the war uh, has on the economics uh, of Europe. A mnozí kolegové ze jednosti zakladajících zakladajících zemí EU říkají, že dobře, že zrovna Česká republika je v těch v těchto českých časech předsednickou zemí. Uh, many members of the EU, especially the founding members, uh, say that they are very happy that it is the Czech Republic who is uh, um, the pre- presidency uh, country uh, in these extremely difficult times. My máme vlastní historickou zkušenost ze sovětskou okupací z roku 1968. We have our very own historical experience with the uh, Soviet occupation from 1968. Pro generaci mých rodičů a prarodičů tím skončila uh, to naděje na svobodný život. For the generation of my parents and grandparents, this was the end of hope for a life in liberty. Vůbec na začátku té války Putina a Ukrajiny, zejména země střední a východní Evropy, moc dobře věděli, o co jde. Especially at the beginning of the war, the countries of Central and East Europe knew very well what uh, is going on. Ukrajina nebojí jenom za svoji svobodu a za svou nezávislost, ale i za nezávislost a svobodu a hodnoty demokratické Evropy. Ukraine is not fighting only for its freedom and uh, independence, but they are also fighting for the freedom uh, and independence and also for the democratic values of the whole Europe. Já už jsem říkal v tom svém úvodním vystoupení, že mnohdy Evropa v minulosti vlastně vyměnila, vyměnila levné dodávky, například ruských surovin, za investice do bezpečnosti. Uh, I said in my speech before that uh, in the history in the past Europe often exchanged uh, uh, cheap gas uh, for security and for independence. Proto je tou druhou prioritou našeho předsednictví je posílení obrany schopnosti Evropy jako celku a z, uh, plnění našich spojenských závazků v rámci NATO. Which is why the second priority of the Czech uh, presidency is to strengthen uh, the defenses and also a uh, contribute more uh, to the NATO. Další, další naší prioritou je vlastně posílení odolnosti evropské ekonomiky. Uh, another priority is to strengthening uh, the resilience of the Czech uh, oh, sorry of the European economy. Vlastně v, v rámci covidové pandemie jsme poprvé viděli, jaké jsou dopady narušení dodavatelských řetězců. During the covid pandemic it was the first time when we saw what happens then when the supply chains are disrupted. A hned poté přišla vlastně ta válka na Ukrajině. To znamená, my musíme být více schopni vyrábět klíčové komponenty přímo na našem kontinentě. And then the covid pandemic was directly followed uh, by uh, the war in Ukraine and this showed us how much we have to be able to uh, produce uh, the basic or manufacture the basic components uh, uh, on the continent. Česká republika je nejvíce průmyslová země v rámci Evropy a viděli jsme, jak špatný dopad na naši ekonomiku měl například nedostatek čipů. Uh, Czech Republic uh, is the most industrial country within Europe and we saw what an impact it had on our economy when there was a shortage of chips. A tady jako sledujeme z Evropy, řekl velmi zajímavou diskuzi ve Spojených státech o tom, jaké mít obchodní vztahy s Čínou. And of course, then we see here in Europe uh, very interesting discussions about uh, what kind of relationships, which kind of business relationships we should be having with China. A myslím, že Evropa se v tom může inspirovat Spojených států. And I must say that uh, Europe can take inspiration uh, from United States uh, in this respect. Zase mnohé evropské společnosti v minulých letech upřednostili nižší výrobní náklady. 
Číně proti té bezpečnosti dodávek. Uh, many European companies uh, in the past actually preferred cheaper uh, components, cheaper business uh, over the security uh, of uh, the, the deliveries. Jako konzervativní politik samozřejmě podporuju jako volný trh a, a soutěž privátního kapitálu. Uh, as a conservative politician, obviously I do support uh, uh, free market uh, uh, and uh, competition. Ale je velmi zajímavé, že společnosti, které investovaly v Rusku nebo v Číně, po té, co se ukážou ty investice jako riskantní, se obracejí s žádostí o pomoc na vládu. But it's actually quite interesting to see how those companies, which mostly invested in Russia or China, now that the situation has changed and they are in trouble, they are looking uh, to government and asking uh, the government for help. Which is why my answer is, uh, you went, what kind of, uh, you knew what kind of countries you were cooperating with, you went, uh, you entered that risk. Uh, but you also had higher profits, so now you have to carry those risks without the help of uh, government. But obviously this opinion is not particularly popular. Another thing that I must mention uh, is uh, security in the cyberspace. Uh, moje původní profesor je programátor, takže vím, jak nebezpečné prostředí to je. I'm a programmer by profession, so I know how uh, dangerous this uh, environment can be. A, a reálně jsme pod obrovskou disinformační vlnou, jak z Ruska, tak z Číny, dlouhodobě. Uh, and we are un, under a long-term uh, attack of misinformation coming from both Russia and China. A to vlastně souvisí s poslední a pátou prioritou našeho předsednictví, a to je zvýšení odolnosti těch základních demokratických institucí. Uh, and this is closely connected with the fifth priority of the Czech presidency, which is to increase the resilience of democratic institutions against disinformation. Naše demokracie má 33 let po pádu komunismu. A uh, musíme zvyšovat vlastně důvěru obyvatelstva z tyto instituce. Our democracy um, has the history of 33 years after the fall of communism and we must keep on working on increasing the trust in democratic institutions. A to všechno je role předsednické země. And all of this is the job of a presidency country. A, a poslední, my jsme mluvili o těch vysokých cenách energií, tak my se jako ministři financí snažíme najít evropské řešení, protože to je levnější pro naše národní rozpočty. And finally, one more thing that uh, as uh, all uh, EU countries, we are looking uh, to find a European uh, solution because it's cheaper and it's better uh, for all of us. Thank you. And, and on that point about a European solution or a European view of these challenges, um, looking at the situation from Prague, how do you see cohesion across Europe right now on some of these issues like sanctions? Uh, energy diversification. Uh, yep. Do, do you, are you confident that uh, in the coming months and perhaps even years, depending on how long the conflict lasts, that this cohesion and unity will remain? Uh, I think, I know, I think I am sure our the best weapon is a unity, European countries against Putin. Uh, Putin uh, didn't. Um, estimate it, uh, I am sure. And for us, it's uh, very, uh, very uh, important to uh, make unity. And uh, we, uh, we uh, last week, we approved uh, eight package sanctions against uh, Russia and Belarus. And uh, yes, uh, I can uh, imagine uh, better and stronger uh, sanctions, but Unity is uh, most uh, uh, important. And social cohesion between uh, European countries and uh, European member states, it's uh, uh, winter, in, uh, winter is coming and <laughs> it's a very, uh, very difficult answer uh, because uh, each member state has different energy mix and different situation uh, before winter. Uh, for example, the Czech Republic bought new LNG capacity in Netherlands. 
very good solution. We decrease our dependency about 33% by one, one deal with our European partner. And it is a way to manage uh, this winter. For example, in the um, last year, during the first uh, eight months, uh, Russia deliveries of gas uh, were 40% 40, 40 of consumption of Europe. And this year, only 9%. We decreased these deliveries about 31% during eight months. It's a very, very good result. Uh, yes, it's very important uh, our uh, safety, so sorry? Uh, savings. Uh, savings of consumption, uh, especially households and companies too, and it's a way to cut off uh, uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels. It is quite extraordinary how quickly Europe has been able to start the diversification process away from Russian energy. And especially on the issue of natural gas, it's my understanding that um, storage capacity is very high across yeah. Europe right now. And that if the winter isn't uh, historically cold, Europe should be okay. So from my assessment, it's not this winter we should be worried about, it's the next winter. Do you think Europe will be ready for the next winter? Will some of these um, uh, ad hoc uh, changes in the energy market yeah. be able to change for the longer term um, in Europe? Very good question for <laughs> next winter. Uh, I agree. I know you're not and a I, fortune teller. Uh, I agree. But <laughs> Uh, we need uh, two years to change our energy policy as uh, European Union. Yes, the first steps uh, are very often uh, uh, the faster, yeah. and next steps are more difficult. And our partners from Poland and Germany are now preparing uh, new LNG terminals. And it is a solution for, for next winter. And now uh, our storage full, I think, 92% in the Czech Republic, in Germany uh, too, uh, more than 90%. Uh, and it is my first morning reading uh, uh, report from uh, storages. Uh, and today, uh, uh, today morning in Washington, I read uh, very good news. And uh, uh, today we increase our uh, storage. Uh, uh, plus 10 million uh, liter, uh, a cu a cubic meter, and now today it is 91.5%. Uh, and every day we, when we don't uh, take from storage is good yep. for, for, uh, for winter. Yep. Because uh, in April we read a black scenario this winter. Unfortunately, it is not true. It, I think it's task uh, uh, Europe, uh, for European governments uh, uh, thinking about black scenarios and might all to, to prevent this scenario. Yeah. And uh, we, we need a mild winter. And more uh, to mild winter is, yeah. is my <laughs> wish for, for Europe. <laughs> well, let's hope. Let's hope that mild winters uh, will uh, take place in Europe in the coming years. Um, we, we've discussed uh, matters at the European Union level. Uh, I do want to talk about NATO in a little bit, but before we do that, I wanted to focus more regionally. Um, of course, the Czech Republic uh, is involved in the Visegrad 4. Um, also, the Three Seas Initiative is being discussed more and more, especially here in Washington. There is a certain amount of enthusiasm for the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, I was wondering what, um, you know, what is the health of the V4 in terms of regional cooperation? Uh, what is the future of the Three Seas Initiative? Do you see the Three Seas Initiative, for example, playing a possible role in any future reconstruction efforts for Ukraine, God willing, uh, when the war ends? 
Zase zvolím čeští, může to těžká otázka. Uh, this is a difficult question, so I'll switch to Czech again. Uh, tak uh, V4 jsou dlouhodobě spolupráce země Česko-Slovensko. Jsme byli roky jeden stát. Polsko, já žiju a pocházím z města, které je tři kilometry od Polska a Maďarsko. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let me start with V4. Uh, there's been a long-term cooperation between uh, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia because for a long time we were one country, obviously. Yeah. Czechoslovakia. Uh, when it comes to Poland, I live in a city which is three kilometers from the Polish borders. Takže Polsko znám velmi dobře a jsou to opravdu přátelé, které Česká republika potřebuje. So I know Poland very well and we think of them as friends, uh, which the Czech Republic needs very much. Ale je pravda, že v poslední době máme velmi často různé názory s Maďarskem. But it's true that recently we started having a difference of opinions with Hungary. Uh, Maďarsko sází mnohem víc než ostatní členové na spolupráci s Ruskem. Mm. Uh, Hungary puts a lot more stress on than other countries of V4 uh, with, uh, on cooperation with uh, Russia. Ale zatím pro každý z těch osmi sankčních balíčků samozřejmě muselo hlasovat i Maďarsko. But so far for all the from all the eight sanction packages uh, um, Hungary also raised their hand they agreed with them. Takže Maďarsko zatím nehraje toho trojského koně v rámci Evropské unie. So so far Hungary has not started playing the Trojan horse within the European Union. A proto já třeba um, nejsem si jsem velkých a silných gest vůči Maďarsku. Which is why I don't really support uh, very strong uh, gestures uh, um, towards Hungary. Já věřím spíš trpělivě vyjednávání za oponou s tím, abychom našli zhodu i s nimi. And I believe uh, in long and patient negotiations behind the scene just to make sure that we find uh, cooperation and or common talking, ground. You're talking about um, strong gestures from Brussels. Is that right? Uh, not only from Brussels, but from um, some uh, member states too, right. and uh, very often from left-wing parties too. Yep, right. Uh, I, I think it will last for uh, all EU, because if we divide it, it will victory of Putin. Yeah. No victory for West countries or Uh, some member states or some political parties, I'm sure. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if it, uh, is it uh, difficult? Yes, it is. Uh, for example, me and my team, uh, which is uh, here, we visited Budapest and we negotiating with uh, my uh, counterpart, uh, Minister of Finance of Hungary. And uh, I understand uh, very often uh, their uh, approaches. Uh, sometimes uh, I, uh, I didn't understand, uh, but uh, I am sure we, we need uh, close cooperation and uh, good uh, negotiation and good conversation with our partners. Right. And I interrupted But it is a difficult yeah. question. Uh, it, yeah. It's true in for the us. In the three C's initiative. Because, uh, Brussels, uh, I think uh, four weeks ago, offered to uh, cut money from Hungary. It is on agenda of ECOFIN, and I am a president of ECOFIN these six months. And uh, today I uh, expect a decision of our ambassadors to uh, postpone, <laughs> postpone to, uh, about two months for Hungary to solution some issues, for example, new law against corruption. Right, right. And uh, the three C's initiative. Popravdě řešeno v této chvíli to trošku spí. To be honest, right now, um, it's uh, on the back burner. Yeah. Uh, my jsme minulý týden v Praze vyzkoušeli nový formát uh, Evropské politické společenství. Last week in Prague, we tried a new format of uh, European cooperation. Kdy uh, můj uh, premiér přivítal na Pražském hradě další 47 hlav států z celé Evropy. Uh, when the Prime Minister of uh, the Czech Republic welcomed uh, 47 leaders of European countries at the Prague Castle. 
Byly tam členské státy EU, nečlenské státy, státy, chtěj, které chtějí být v EU, nebo ty, které vystoupily z EU, nebo které, které tam nechtějí být. Uh-huh. And it was a combination of member states, non-member states, states which left the EU, uh, those who are aspiring, who are candidate states, uh, and those who are not interested in entering the EU. <laughs> uh, without official agenda, uh, very good space for talking and negotiation. Uh, for example, first uh, first goal meeting between prime minister of azerbaijan and armenia yes and uh, they can uh, talk uh, directly about uh, horny karabakh horny karabakh 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 you understand yes uh, and uh, what interesting discussion with uh, prime minister from turkey erdogan mm-hmm and uh, other uh, European leaders. Very good format. And, but we will see how, how uh, successful will, uh, will this new, new format. And in these uh, hard times, it is time for details cooperation in the 3 Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have w- one more question I want to ask about NATO before we open it up to the floor. So if you have a question in your head or if you're drafting one in your head, get it ready, please. Um, Of course, uh, multiple U.S. administrations have criticized some European countries for not spending enough on defense or meeting the 2% of GDP benchmark for for NATO for defense spending. Um, Since 2014, uh, when after Russia first invaded Ukraine, we have seen the European defense spending increase year on year. And in the aftermath of the most recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've seen even stronger commitments and stronger action to increasing defense spending. And of course, Minister, you said that the Czech Republic has uh, committed to the 2% benchmark. I think everyone here in Washington would welcome that. Uh, But I wanted to ask you specifically about NATO and your role as a finance minister. One idea that I've been proposing for years is for NATO at their summit to have a special session for finance ministers. So finance ministers can understand why defense is so expensive, why it costs so much. And here in America, we we don't really understand how the the parliamentary system of democracy works uh, in terms of the authorizations of funding, for example. Uh, most of the power lies with, with, with you, Minister, in the Czech Republic on, on spending money uh, and not with the legislative body uh-huh. like uh-huh. here in America. So do you see any merit, any utility in this idea of getting the finance ministers, you and your European colleagues, more involved yeah. Yeah. at the NATO level? Uh, first of all, I must say that I agree with that criticism that we did not spend enough of def- on defense in the past. Moje politická strana byla, jak jsem říkal, osmé opozici a vlastně používali jsme stejná slova. My political party was in the opposition for eight years and we used the exact words of criticism. Hmm. A je vlastně škoda, že ta kritika nepřišla zevnitř těch členských zemí a že jsme ji potřebovali ze strany Spojených států. Uh, and it's actually a pity that this criticism did not come from within the EU and that we actually needed to hear that from the USA. A souhlasím, že minulý od roku 2014, když Putin obsadil Krym, bylo jasné, že se nezastaví. And I also agree that in 2014 when Putin um, attacked uh, Crimea, uh, it was clear that he would not stop there. Dneska situace změnila, v podstatě všechny státy chtějí zvýšit výdaje na obranu. Obviously, the situation today is very different. All the countries are ready to increase uh, um, uh, defense expenditures. And now the problem we are facing is different because I see the queue, the line of, uh, of people interested in buying uh, military equipment. <laughs> For example, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Republic needs uh, support with... Uh, uh, better time for delivery uh, U.S. weapons to uh, for uh, our uh, Czech uh, forces. Uh, 
A, ale ať se vrátím k té otázce. Já si umím představit, co by za užitečné ten formát ministru financí v rámci NATO. But to get back to your question, I can imagine, and I think it's an interesting and useful idea and concept uh, to involve uh, the ministers of finance into NATO. Ale jako zkušený politik vím, že ti, kteří tam jezdí dneska, my si obraně se nebudou chtít vzdát hmm. své pravomoci. But as an experienced politician, I must tell you that uh, the ministers of defense who are now attending uh, the meetings of NATO or the summit uh, of NATO would not be very willing to give up their position. <laughs> Nekaždý má to štěstí, že ministrní obrany v České republice je moje kolegyně z mé politické strany. And not everybody is as lucky as I am because the minister of defense uh, in the Czech Republic is my colleague from the same political party. Takže my opravdu máme stejné názory a není žádný problém v spolupráci finance a obrana. So we pretty much have the same opinions and there's absolutely no issue when it comes to cooperation between defense and finance. Ale členský stát velmi často je minister financí z jiné politické strany než, než minister obrany. Já myslím, že to je jiná tradice než ve Spojených státech. But in other member states very often uh, the minister of defense comes from a different political party than the minister of finance and I know that's a very different situation from the one that you have here in the USA. A teď jako bez, bez vtipkování klíčová klíčová je podpora uh, předsedy vlády nebo prezidenta. But jokes aside what I see as key is the support of uh, the prime minister and the president. A my cítíme podporu uh, našeho premiéra jak finance tak obrana tomu abychom splnili náš závazek. And I must say that uh, we feel a very strong support from the side of our prime minister both defense and the finance to meet our obligation our commitment. A pak není složité najít ty peníze složitější bude získat v dobrém termínu ty zbraně které potřebujeme. So given our situation it's not really difficult to find that uh, that consent uh, uh, we are all um, um, you know of the same opinion so much more difficult in this case will be actually to get the equipment to be able to purchase it. Ale co pož velmi důležité, abychom nemysleli na tu dodávku těch stávajících zbraňových systémů, ale bychom hodně jako Evropa investovali do výzkumu v oblasti obrany. What I also see as extremely important is to not just uh, spend money on purchasing the equipment but also to invest in development uh, of defense mechanisms. Great. Yeah. Well, the problem really isn't with Eastern Europe, as we've seen. Uh, I think perhaps some of the finance ministers from Western Europe should definitely uh, be a little more active uh, in their understanding on why defense is so important and also so expensive. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if, uh, yes, sir, in the front. There's a microphone. If you could please identify yourself, any relevant affiliation, uh, that would be wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Tom Lindbergh. I'm a senior fellow here at Tuscan Institute. I wanted to ask if you would say a few more words about China. Obviously, we're caught up in an immediate crisis with the war in Ukraine, but you've made some rather provocative remarks that suggested at least a possibility of a longer term decoupling of economic linkages surrounding supply chain security. Maybe that word goes too far, um, but I was hoping you might uh, uh, take a step away from the uh, immediate crisis and talk to that longer term issue and challenge. Good question. Um, se vlastně intenzivně nedebatují v těchto posledních měsících, protože řešíme dopady Putinovy agrese. I must say that we are not really discussing very intensively our relationship with China in these past months because we are mostly focusing on the impact of the Russian war on Europe. Ale po debatě s našimi businessmeny jsem jako vyjádřil názor, že je čas přehodnotit ten převod investic z jednostrany z Evropy do Číny a že je čas část té výroby vracet zpátky. Uh, but after discussing this issue with uh, some Czech businessmen, I expressed the opinion that it's time uh, to, to change the direction from moving investments from Europe to China only and uh, go in the opposite direction as well. Budou ty výrobky a služby dražší? Budou. Ale je to dobře, podle mě je to dobře, že je to bezpečnější. Well, if the question is, will the products and services be more expensive? Well, obviously, yes. Uh, but uh, that's okay, because that's the better solution. A ty dodatelské řetězce nám narušil COVID, ale stejně tak, podle mě, to může kdykoliv narušit rozhodnutí čínské vlády. The supply chains were disrupted uh, by COVID, but I believe that they can also be disrupted by the decision of the Chinese government. Uh, pokud uh, jsou demokratické země, 
kde funguje normální tržní principy, tak tam se nebojím o tom, že by byl nějaký obchodní problém. If we're talking about democratic countries where the standard uh, economic principles are in force, then I don't, I don't see a problem there. Ale bojím se, okamžiku jsme závislí na někom, který může z politických důvodů uh, narušit tu hospodářskou spolupráci. But I am afraid of those who might for political reasons uh, disrupt the economic cooperation. My vidíme, co dělá Putin s cenou plynu. On manipuluje cenou plynu a bohužel my v Evropě máme špatně fungující trh s plynem. Uh, we see what is happening uh, when Putin is manipulating the price of gas and unfortunately the situation on the European market uh, is, uh, is very difficult right now. The prices are incredibly high. My jsme byli schopni během dvou dnů zaznamenat růst cen plynu 400 euro na 1000 euro, to znamená o více než 100% během dvou dnů. Uh, we witnessed a situation when the price of gas uh, went from 400 euro to 1000 euro, which is more than a hundred percent increase in within two days. From 400 to 1000, and last year was price 30. <laughs> yeah, it is a big, uh, big problem. And uh, we uh, have to be uh, very careful with uh, business uh, relations with China, I'm sure. I'm Monica Palotta, should I turn Okay, uh, Hudson Institute, and my question would be about the uh, gas price cap. Um, it's highly decisive at the uh, European Union at the moment. My question, I mean, uh, the Czech Republic gave the green light to it, but at the moment, uh, the gas prices um, are at the normal level, considering what it was a couple of weeks ago. It's at uh, 138. Last year it was 38, as you said, but it was much higher. So at the moment it, it's quite constant or it can stay, but introducing a price cap, and especially on gas, it can just skyrocket the price again. And also the freight prices, uh, LNG ships, it's, it's like, what, 500 times higher than it's normally the average. And there comes again the LNG infrastructure, which is quite the limit at the moment in the European Union. So, Aren't you afraid that introducing the price cap is going to sky? It, it's going to be a tight market, and not talking about that LNG market is quite competitive, and especially the U.S. I mean, it shifted from Asia, leaving Asia on a diet toward Europe. So, could it be really the solution? Is it temporary? When it is accepted, if it is accepted, can it be changed? I mean, having unity on sanctions in in the European Union is quite challenging itself. I am for. Uh capping of uh, price of gas uh, because uh, I said how manipulated Putin with this price, but I am sure it will only temporary solution, no final uh, solution. And for us is uh, most important the coupling. Uh, it is uh, cutting price of electricity from uh, price of gas because it is the biggest problem in uh, our uh, European energy prices. Uh, because it is uh, the last uh, last plant uh, created a price for all market. For example, in the Czech Republic, we have only one gas plant without uh, influence to our domestic uh, uh, market. Because we prefer nuclear energy, it was a very good solution. We see now it's a very good solution, nuclear uh, plant uh, companies uh, and uh, today uh, is majority of member states for for cut uh, for a cup of uh, cup of uh, price of gas but uh, we we need uh, uh, approval of germany because it's the biggest problem for germany germany has 25% uh, of uh, electricity producer from gas plant. It is a very uh, expensive uh, solution for Germany. But uh, we expect in two weeks a new European Council and this decision in the European Council of cup of uh, uh, price of gas or uh, maybe it's enough uh, the coupling is cutting, uh, dividing, uh, split, splitting uh, price of electricity from price of gas. 
it's uh, it will good news for for uh, energy market in Europe. Great. Well, Minister, I know when you travel on these international visits, especially to Washington D.C. in in your capacity as uh, not only the Czech finance minister, but also the Czech finance minister during the Czech presidency yeah, of the yeah, EU. Yeah. You're a very busy man. So uh, we, we really appreciate it here at Hudson, uh, you finding the time to come here and speak with us today. Uh, you have a fantastic embassy to work with here in Washington, and uh, you're always welcome here whenever you come back, uh, if, if yeah. you want to come back again. And uh, just thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And I want to thank our audience for taking time to come here today to, uh, to listen and to engage. And please make sure you check out Hudson.org for future events. And you can also find this event streamed on our website as well. So please join me in thanking the minister. For uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion for me. Thank you. Thank you.